so the other day, a patient told me, Doc, I think my heart is trying to kill me. I said, what? What do you mean? He said, well, my heart is clotting against me. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Dr. Ryan here. Uh, today, we're talking about our beloved DVT, deep vein a thrombus. We've got a 27-year-old woman who comes in to your clinic, and she develops left leg swelling during week 20 of her pregnancy. All right. Left lower extremity ultrasound reveals a left iliac vein, deep vein thrombosis. Now, proper management includes which of the following? A, bed rest. B, catheter-directed thrombolysis. C, inoxaparin. D, uh, inferior vena cava uh, filter placement. And E, warfarin. Remember that she is pregnant. <laughs> Some beautiful images, uh, courtesy of shock case in clinical medicine. Here we can see what is a deep vein thrombus in the left lower limb. And if you compare these two, you can see a notable discrepant swelling involving the left more than the right. Okay, the same situation here of the right lower limb. Uh, swollen, it's larger, right? Often it's erythematous and it's tender and it's warm. Here, DVT of the right upper limb. Notice the extensive edema, right? And it's usually putting edema. So, what are the predisposing factors for the deep vein thrombus? So, we look at this beautiful triad called Virchow's triad, which is basically stasis, vascular endothelial damage, and hypercoagulability. So, under stasis, if the patient has had history of prolonged bed rest or immobilization, typically following an acute myocardial infarct, a cerebrovascular accident, or a fracture, which renders them immobile, okay? Now, the second thing which contributes to stasis is that they are post-operative, especially prostatectomy or hip or pelvic surgery, lower limb surgery, obviously pregnancy in the propurium as well because patients are less likely to move in these states. Leave alone that these are procoagulable states. Procoagulable, sorry, states. The second uh, portion of Virchow's triad is vascular endothelial damage. So here we look at has a patient had recent trauma or surgery, commonly uh, post prostatectomy abdominal or pelvic surgery. Does the patient have varicose veins? Do they have Burgers or Reynolds disease? And then hypercoagulability is the third uh, portion of Virchow's triad. So does the patient take an oral contraceptive pill? Is there what you think may be systemic lupus erythematosus going on due to antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? So you want to elicit a history of miscarriages, and you got uh, typically at least two second trimester uh, uh, miscarriages, and you want to do your anti lupus. Um, anticoagulant, you want to do your anti beta glycoprotein and anti cardiolipin antibodies. Nephrotic syndrome is that on board, so you got heavy proteinuria together with hypoalbuminemia and you got dyslipidemia, you got a, a, a propensity to clot, all right? Um, and nephrotic syndrome, you know, you ping out your protein C and S. So if you ping out your anticoagulants, that actually pushes the body homeostatically towards a procoagulant state. Is there hematological disease, the likes of polycythemia, rubra vera, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, myelofibrosis, disseminated intravascular coagulation, essential thrombocythemia? All of these are pre pro coagulant states. Is there what may be an internal malignancy going on? Right? For instance, uh, carcinoma of the pancreas, quite common, CA lung, ovary, and stomach. Is there deficiency of your anticoagulants? And the claim to fame for these antithrombin 3, protein C and S, factor 5 laden, right? as well as uh, is there septicemia on board. Okay, what's the differential diagnosis? So you see this edematous, uh, tender, warm, uh, discrepant, uh, uh, putting edema unilaterally of the leg, sometimes of the arm. What's the differential? Cellulitis, ruptured Baker's cyst, or it could be post-traumatic, and this is a calf hematoma, right? Obviously, if it's non-putting, you're thinking more along the lines of uh, lymphedema. So what history should be taken in a patient with deep vein thrombus? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Firstly, the onset. Is it acute, chronic, or recurrent? History of recent immobilization, and we spoke about Virchow's triad and how immobilization contributes to stasis in the way of uh, prolonged bed rest, surgery, recent CVA, history of air travel, uh, drug history, especially the use of oral contraceptive pills, uh, history of any primary disease, we went through these, we said hematological issues, malignancy, autoimmune, nephronic syndrome, SLE. Is there a family history, which think, makes you think about thrombophilias? What are the causes of recurrent DVT? The antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and SLE, deficiency of antithrombin 3, protein C and S, and factor 5 latent mutation, polycythemia rubra vera, oral contraceptive pill use, and malignancy. 
Okay, fine. You think there's a DVT. It looks like, it smells like a DVT. How do you diagnose it? Well, the money throwing investigation is a Doppler ultrasound of the lower limb vessels. And what we actually note is the velocity of the blood flow in the vein, especially on compression. D-dimer is very sensitive, but not very specific. What do we mean? Because the value of the D-dimer is in its positive predictive value. So if the test, the test is negative, you can essentially exclude a deep vein thrombus. But if the, the D-dimer is positive, that does not necessarily mean that the patient has a deep vein thrombus. As we know, there's a big differential for a high D-dimer, including pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarct, pneumonia, sepsis, the list goes on. However, a low D-dimer excludes DVT in low-risk patients. But if it's a high-risk patient and the D-dimer is negative, the patient may still have a DVT. Venography is obviously the confirmatory investigation. What other investigations should you do to ascertain the cause in someone who has a deep vein thrombus? as well? You can do a full blood count and an ESR uh, for polycythemia rubra vera. Here the hemoglobin is going to be high and your hematocrit is also probably going to be high. And there's primary and secondary flavors of polycythemia. But rubra vera speaks to the uh, idiopathic variety. Okay, antithrombin 3, protein C and S, no deficiencies of these pushes you towards a procoagulant state. The same story with factor 5 laden. Do an anti-nuclear factor, anti-double standard DNA, anti-phospholipid antibody. If you think that there are clinical stigmata, as well as a history suggestive of systemic lupus erythematosus, sedum homocysteine level, X-ray of the chest, you're searching for a malignancy, ultrasound abdomen as well, searching for a malignancy. How can a deep vein thrombus complicate? Well, the most well-known claim to fame complication is pulmonary embolism, commonly coming from thrombosis, but where? In the iliofemoral vein and less commonly from below knee thrombosis. It can also complicate with venous gangrene and something we call the post phlebitic syndrome, because chronic DVT results in a permanently swollen limb with ulcerations and lipodematosclerosis. How do we treat a deep vein thrombus? Well, there's different arms to it. First up, we talk about general treatment, which entails bed rest and analgesia. You remember this from our clinical case today. Use of elastic stockings from the midfoot to below the knee, especially if there's calf thrombosis. Intermittent elevation of the foot during day and night, especially above the level of the heart. And mobilization slowly, only once fully anticoagulated. So get your physio in only after the patient is appropriately anticoagulated. Otherwise, you're going to embolize that clot. Second is anticoagulation. So for above knee thrombosis, these must be anticoagulated as there's a greater chance of it propagating to a pulmonary embolus. A below knee DVT should also be anticoagulated for six weeks. If anticoagulation is contraindicated, for whatever reason, or you're dealing with a recurrent pulmonary embolism, then an inferior vena cava filter is the way to go. How do we anticoagulate? So we can use uh, unfractionated heparin, UFH, and initially a 5,000 unit loading dose is given, then a continuous infusion of 1 to 2,000 units per hour with an infusion pump. And how do we monitor this is with the APTT, right? Um, a partial thromboplastin time. Uh, which should be done, and we aim for a value of 1.5 to 2.5 times to control given for five days. Alternative for this, which is in the more popular variety, is low molecular weight heparin, which is enoxyparin, which is given at a dose of 1.5 milligram per kg per day subcutaneously, and of course you've got to reduce the dose in renal failure. In terms of the anticoagulant arm, there's a couple of options, but warfarin is probably the one which is most common. Warfarin, we said, should be initiated with heparin because, remember, it takes 48 hours to achieve the full effect. And remember that the way warfarin acts is that it inhibits your vitamin K-dependent factors, which is factors 10, 9, 7, 2. 10, 9, 7, 2. However, protein C and S are also vitamin K-dependent. And because the half-life of protein C and S is shorter than that of 10, 9, 7, and 2, when you start the warfarin initially, if you start it, alone, you may actually push the patient towards a procoagulant state within the first few days. So within the first 48 hours, you've got to cover them concomitantly with heparin and usually enoxaparin. And then we, we, we dose according to an INR target of about 2.5. If this is a single episode of venous thromboembolism, warfarin should be continued for at least three months. If a definitive cause is found and addressed, then four to six weeks of warfarin may be sufficient. But if no cause is found, or if permanent risk factors are present, warfarin should be continu continued for at least six months. If this is the recurrent case of deep vein thrombus, it should be continued for even a longer time, sometimes even lifelong. 
Now, once the patient is on warfarin, if your INR is above 3 but below 6, you want to stop or reduce the warfarin dose. If the INR is above 6 but below 8 with no bleeding, you can stop the warfarin and restart it whenever the INR dips below 5. If the INR is above 8 with no or minor bleeding, you stop the warfarin and restart when the INR is below 5. If other factors for bleeding are present, you probably want to give oral vitamin K, 0.5 to 2.5 milligrams may be given. If there's a major bleeding episode, we can give prothrombin, complex concentrate at 50 units per kg or you can opt for fresh frozen plasma at 15 mils per kg may be given vitamin k as well oral or iv may be administered the other more attractive option are the noax the novel oral anticoagulants the probably one of the most uh, popular is rivaroxaban which is otherwise more affectionately terms the Delto, which is an oral factor 10a inhibitor the dose is 15 milligrams 12 hourly for 21 days after food and thereafter 20 milligrams daily for six months and of course you've got to note the dose reduction if the patient has renal failure now why is enoxaparin preferred which is low molecular weight heparin because it does not affect the aptt so there's no need for regular aptt monitoring it has a long half-life so that the ease of the administration can be given as a single those daily has very good bioavailability has the greater activity against factor 10a that's its claim to fame in terms of mechanism of action can be given as a fixed dose and there's less inhibition of platelets because as we know standard heparin can cause our beloved hit it hits you like that <laughs> thrombocytopenia and thrombosis What's the mode of action of heparin? It acts by potentiating the activity of antithrombin, which then inhibits the procoagulant enzyme activity of factors 1972. Why do I say 1972? Because factors 10, 9, 7, and 2. Uh, one of the complications of long-term heparin use, we already touched on thrombocytopenia, especially if the heparin is used for more than 7 to 10 days, it can cause osteoporosis long-term and hyperkalemia if heparin is used once again for longer than a week. What's the antidote for heparin? It's our beloved protein sulfate. What's the mechanism of action of warfarin? It inhibits your vitamin K defending factors, which we said is 1972. Factors 10, 9, 7, and 2. What's the antidote for warfarin is, of course, vitamin K. And how do we prevent DVT? So encourage early mobilization, leg exercise, elastic stockings, low dose aspirin. You can also give clexane. Uh, it should be given following surgery or an acute MI, uh, which is of course an oxyparin at a dose of 40 milligrams subcutaneously daily. Avoid oral contraceptive pull and address your primary etiology. So everybody, in our clinical case, we had a young female who's pregnant. It's the 20th week of pregnancy and a lower extremity ultrasound reveals a left iliac vein DVT. What would proper management include? Dum -dum -dum, enoxaparin. So pregnancy, as we know, induces a hypocalculable state and a DVT occurs in one out of 2,000 pregnancies. Watch out! Now, DVT probably occurs more commonly in the left leg than the right leg. Why? Because during pregnancy, there's compression of the left iliac vein by the gravid uterus. Now, clexane or low molecular weight heparin or enoxaparin is an appropriate therapy at this point in pregnancy, but it's typically switched to unfractionated heparin four weeks prior to anticipated delivery because clexane can be associated with the increased risk of epidural hematoma. Watch out for that. Warfarin is strictly contraindicated because of its teratogenic potential. Beloved, today I want to address the topic of death or life. All right, Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, the Lord says, This day I call the heaven and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you two options, life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life that you and your children may live. In the book of John 11, 25, Jesus Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life. If any man believes in me, even though he is dead, yet shall he live. And the one who lives and believes in me shall never die. Which means that the only way to eternal life, the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in John 4 and 6, Behold, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John eleven twenty five 25 tells us, Behold, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Beloved, I pray that you'll put your hope and trust in Jesus today. I love you all. Here are my references. God bless you. Have yourself a fantastic day.